Macroeconomics, uh, lecture number 10. Uh, today's uh, topic is demand for money or money demand. What we have is, uh, or the objective today is to explain five fundamental factors determining money demand. So, factor number one is supply of goods and services. If you'd remember, I already covered this before. Uh, this is the most important and the most fundamental of all factors of money demand. Um, in order to demand money, there must be something offered in exchange for money. And that something offered in exchange for money should be goods or services. So, that also includes labor too. So, producers, when they offer their goods, they effectively demand money. Uh, when, let's say, we professors offer our teaching services, again, we effectively demand money. So, demand for money, you must remember, is not about wishful thinking. We wish millions or trillions. It is about effectively supplying on the, mar on the market something in exchange uh, for that money. Number two is frequency of payment. Frequency of payment simply means how often someone gets paid or how often payments are made in uh, society. Suppose a professor earns uh, $60,000 a year, or let's say uh, five a month, but he gets paid in a lump sum. So, he gets paid $60,000 during the year, and if this is uh, one year, which I denote by 12 months, so I have six, three, And we have, uh, let's say, this will be here, money holding. Money holding is the same as money balances. And the guy gets his 60,000, thousand I denote with K, and it has to last that person a full year. He will be spending steadily roughly 5000 a month. So his money balance will be 60 at the beginning of his payment, then it will go down to 54, etc. And on month 12, right before he gets paid again, he will have a balance of almost zero, or his balance will approach zero. So, his balance will be effectively a straight line on the way down. The assumption here is that he is spending uniformly. All right? So, the question is, if there is only one payment, one yearly payment, what is his average money balance or his average money holding throughout the year? Well, at the beginning is 60, at the end is zero. The average money holding must be the mean or the average of the two. So, with an annual payment, the same income implies an average money holding of 30K. So, that person will be holding on average 30,000. Why? It's just elementary math. Here it's 60, here it's 54, here it's 48, at the very end it's 5 and 0. You average it over 
number of months, 12 months. So his average is 30,000. All right? Per what? The average. The average, you can actually think of it, the appropriate way to think of it is an integral. An integral provides you the average. Isn't the average five per month or something? Well, the average is 30,000. Now, today, I have, let's say, 100. Tomorrow, I have 95. And the day after, tomorrow, I have 90. My average between 100, 95, and 90 is 95. The average is for a whole period. It is not per month or per day. It is for a period. For the full year, the average balance is 30,000. Now, let's take a look, second uh, case where the guy, the professor is uh, getting paid on a monthly basis. So, you take a look and he is getting paid how much a month? For the same annual income, he's going to be getting 60,000 divided by 12 months, so he's going to be getting 5. So, he will be running down these 5,000 by the end of the month. So, he, he is income will look like this, sorry, not income, that will be cash balances, then he gets paid again, 5,000, and then he gets paid again, and this goes on, and at the beginning of a period, he's got 5,000. At the end of a period, he has only zero, nothing. And the average will be 2,500. So, if the frequency of payment is one month, the average will be 2.5K. Well, you can imagine, for example, that the professor is getting paid weekly. If he's getting paid weekly, his weekly payment will be a little more than thousands. By the end of the week, he'll run out of the thousand. So his average money holding throughout the whole period will be a little over five hundred dollars. So the point to understand here with frequency of payment is that the higher the frequency, Higher frequency means more often, higher frequency results in lower demand for money. So, we write if frequency increases, this means payments occur more often, it results in demand for money Falling. Okay? So that's simple as that. No magic here. So the question now becomes can an increase in frequency over and over again reduce demand for money? And demand for money going down means that prices or price inflation increases. So the question is, can frequency of payments result, due to lowering demand for money, result in sustained price inflation? And the answer here is, of course, not. Society usually gets paid, let's say, monthly. There may be due to societal changes, a shift, one-time shift from monthly payments possibly to weekly payments. And if this is the case, there will be a one-time lowering of demand for money and a one-time increase in prices, and that's it. Of course, if there is a second round from weekly payment going to daily payment, and from daily payments moving to hourly payments, but this has rarely been observed in history. It is usually observed only during hyperinflations. I don't want to get into that. It's a completely different 
story altogether. The point is that frequency of payment can potentially explain uh, lowering demand for money as a one-shot process. It can last maybe three months in a society. It could possibly last for three years. But overall, it cannot be used to explain in any way inflation. Any questions up to here? Sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, I thought that uh, isn't the demand for money the same? Because if we judge it for a year, well, well, then the demand for money with a yearly payment would be 60,000, but the demand for money with a monthly payment would also be 60,000. No, if, if, if <laughs> the answer is no. If I get paid once a year, at the end of the year, I will demand 60. Simple as that. However, if I work only one month, and I will demand and can demand only 5,000. Now, if I'm getting paid what's called bi-weekly, I cannot demand 60,000. And then the next week or two weeks later, again demand 60,000. And then again demand 60,000. I cannot. It is not what the deal is. It is not the understanding. The understanding is if I get paid every week, I will be getting uh, one fifty second of my annual salary. And if I get paid on a monthly basis, I will be getting only one twelfth of my salary. So, the mere fact that I'm getting paid more often implies that I will be getting less, meaning I will be demanding less money, simply because I have earned less. Similarly with a business, uh, again, if the business is getting on one, one lump sum money for a year, same story. They'll demand their own money. But if the business is getting paid on a weekly basis, different story. For example, think of it as uh, a hotel offering a service and you're staying at a hotel for 14 days. There will be a different demand from the hotel manager whether you're going to be paying upfront for the 14 days or at the end for the 14 days or every day you're going to be paying your daily rate. So the frequency in this case does matter. Is this hopefully answer or help you understand? Any other questions up to point two before we move on to three? Any questions? All right, so three is, let's see what is three. Oh, three is a clearing system. So, what is a clearing system? A clearing system is a system or mechanism for which debts of different people may be possibly offset. For example, and I'm just illustrating here, these are not real numbers. For example, if I get paid thousand for any period, maybe bi-weekly or monthly, and I go to consume every day here some university service, let's say a meal at the canteen, and I consume during the month 20 meals, each five level, uh, the university will owe me 1,000, I will owe at the end of the month to the university 100. Without a clearing system, at the end of the month, the university will pay me the amount and at the end of the month I'll go into the university cash register or uh, let's say uh, to the canteen and pay my 100. This is without a clearing system. With a clearing system, of course, uh, every common sense person understands that I will not pay the 100 and the university will not pay me the 1000. Instead, I will get the difference. So, we say we offset my debt with their debt. So, the university will simply pay me 900 net. So, they will pay me my, the amount of money that they owe me, net of my debt or obligation to them. So, what's the deal here? In the first case, without a clearing system, the demand for money at the end of the month 
without the clearing system is thousands will be demanded by the university so it can make its payment and I will demand 100 and I'll have to keep it in my wallet at the end of the month so that the total demand of money without a clearing system will be pure uh, will be sorry 1100 with a clearing system I will not need to hold any cash at the end to pay the university because I will not have anything paid it will be subtracted from my salary and the university will demand only 900 so without a clearing system total demand for money is 1100 with the clearing system total demand is 900 and this is the simplest example with just two counterparties each owing to the other well, uh, let me construct a different uh, uh, example, an example that is uh, realistic, it actually happens now, but with different numbers, numbers are of course uh, changed. It just happens to be that my landlord is a student of AUBG, so his dad owns the apartment, he rents it to me. Well, he's not in this class, don't worry. So, uh, here is the deal. Uh, this is me, right? This is AUBG, and this is landlord. And let's throw some round numbers for the sake of an example. And at the end of the month, we got to be paying each other. What do I pay to my landlord? Rent. Rent. So, what I put in an arrow here, I put it underneath, and we call it a rent. So it's from you, that's from me. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry guys, sorry guys, that's my mistake, that's my mistake, thank you. So, KP has got to pay to LL landlord, and I got to pay 500. Next. Suppose that uh, AUBG is going to pay me a round number of 1,000 and for all purposes I make them at the end of a period. And finally, the arrow has got to go this way. My landlord has got to pay his kids tuition. And in this case, uh, for the sake of a fairly good example, suppose that he has a commitment to make monthly payments. So, his commitment is for 10,000 leva, same currency, 10,000 leva for the year, and he has promised or made an arrangement at the end of every month to pay to the university 1,000. So, you have 1,000. So, we have, as you can see, a circular flow. Landlord owes to AUBG 1,000, AUBG owes me 1,000, and I owe the landlord 500. So, let's write case one. No clearing system. What is the demand for money? Demand for money is straightforward. I demand, let's say, money, uh, demand for money equals mine will be 500. I gotta keep it on cash. Uh, landlord's gotta have thousands available in his balance, and AUBG has gotta have his thousands, and the total money balances are 20. 500, same currency, whether it's Bulgarian Leva or US dollars, doesn't matter. So, case number two, with clear. Let's see who owes what if we had a simple university uh, clearing system. Well, landlord will be owing a net of 500, right? AVG must get 
1,000. Pay 1,000. So what's going to happen here? Let me see. I have to get for sure 500. All right. So I owed 1,000. I got to get 1,000. I got to pay 500. So university has got to pay me 500. What do I owe with a clearing system to my landlord? Zero. So, from my point of view, from my point of view, I gotta get from the university a net of 500 and pay nothing. From my landlord's point of view, he will be getting nothing from me and paying only the difference of 500. From the university point of view, they gotta get the difference of 500 from the landlord and pay it back to me, all right? So what is the total demand in the second case? Will be, uh, what is it? Uh, zero plus 500 plus 500 and it would equal to 1,000. So in the second case, the demand for money fell dramatically. Question, uh, can we make it the way that the landlord pays you straight away so we escape ABG like as a middle person and then the money demand will be well, 500? Well, well but, but, but that's the idea. The idea is to have a large clearing system. There is a possibility within the clearing system, this is exactly what will happen within the clearing system. So the clearing system will be in between here and the way it will work is AUBG will be paying to the clearing system only. Uh, I will be getting money from the clearing system only and my landlord will be effectively paying for getting money. So the clearing system essentially will be a central to everybody else and there won't be any payment directly between the two of us. Usually the way it would work is we'll make the payments uh, will be cleared by the same uh, clearing system. Again, it is important to understand that as long as there is clearing system, whether it is central or not, as long as liabilities are or offset, for every offset of liabilities or of obligations, the demand for money will fall correspondingly. Uh, final example will be, let's say the following classroom example. I'll owe her 10, she'll owe you 10, you will owe her 10, she'll owe him 10, and then everybody owes the next person 10 until the last student would owe me 10. Without the clearing system, we will have currently 25 students. Each might have, must have a 10 that he or she will slide to the next person. So the total money demand will be 250. On the other hand, if there was a clearing system, the 10 that he owes me, I'll offset against the, the 10 that I owe her. So my demand for money will be zero. And so will be hers, and yours, and yours, etc. So when everybody owes the next person a 10, the overall money demand will be effectively zero. Nobody will actually need to hold any money to make the payment because it will be immediately offset. So clearing systems do lower demand for money. So when we say yes or the clearing system is expanding, it results in lower demand for money and lower demand for money will definitely result in uh, prices or the price level going higher. Another example within a clearing system also is provided by credit cards. It is not strictly a clearing system, but it functions as such. When I was in the United States, I had a couple of credit cards in my wallet. So 
I literally carried around with me 20 or 30 dollars for anything and everything I usually paid with a credit card. Now the credit card itself, itself need not be a perfect clearance system, but I will make a purchase, the credit card issue will all the seller, uh, at the end of the month I will, you know, they'll make the payment immediately, uh, at the end of the month when I get my paycheck, I will use the paycheck and pay to my credit card, effectively it results as if there is a clearance system. Now, a credit card balance, you have to understand, is not a cash holding. So, if I have a credit card, uh, for example, and I can uh, withdraw 1000 the maximum that I can withdraw on a credit card is called credit limit. If I have withdrawn at this point only $50, uh, we call this my outstanding balance. And then I have available credit, which is the rest from my outstanding balance to the available limit, 950. This is not cash balance. Credit card means I do not have the money in the bank. The money will lend it to me when I use it, so it's going to be borrowed money. So, balances on credit cards in no way, or credit card limits in no way represent a demand for money. All right? They do not represent demand for money. And what about debit cards? Do they represent? Yes, that was my next point. You read my mind. So, with a debit card, so I pull it in my wallet, I pull out a debit card. With a debit card, I do have $200, and $200 is for me a money holding. For me, it is a cash balance. I deposited these upfront. And this is a cash balance which I can access at any point in time. So, this kind of deposit we call in economics and in banking demand deposit. So, a debit card which is connected or linked to a demand deposit, meaning I can immediately withdraw the balance, does act as cash balance and does in fact represent money demand. All right? So, there is a fundamental difference between a uh, credit card and a debit card. For the debit card, the balance has been deposited up front. It represents an actual money holding and an actual money balance. At any point in time, I can walk in the bank and withdraw the complete amount, the full amount, that I have, or I can use the card to spend it according to the terms of the card usage. And with a credit card, the money is not there, and when I will actually use the credit card, the commercial bank or whoever the card issuer will actually issue a loan. The loan will be created at the moment, and that creation of a loan will actually create new money, but I'll be getting to this of money creation from commercial banks in just a couple of lectures, maybe one or two chapters ahead. Alright, so uh, let's see if there are any questions on a clearing system before I move on to the next. Alright, so next is, uh, what's next? Oh, confidence of money. So, number four, Of money. Now let me tell you a story which I've uh, baffled, been baffled for quite a few months before I was able to figure out what was going on. In the Bulgarian banking system, there has been this summer and this fall, last summer and last fall, roughly from uh, April, May, all the way to December, and even now, 
what people call shortage of money. This to me is phenomenally absurd. How can there possibly be shortage of, and get this, which is even more absurd, Bulgarian leather. At any point in time, uh, a Bulgarian can walk into a commercial bank, exchange his lever for euro. In general, for any country, you got to understand what happens is the shortage is always in the foreign currency. Having shortage in the local currency sounds phenomenally absurd, uh, to the point of impossible. So I had to dig for like three months, asking everybody around, especially for commercial banks, and do tell me, yeah, there is shortage of leva. Shortage of leva are extremely hard to find. That's, I think, I, I tell, telling everybody, this is insane, you guys are getting it, it's impossible. How can there be shortage of money? So I started digging and reading and finally I was able to figure out what was going on. What was going on was something very simple. Bulgarians were not willing to hold Bulgarian lever as money balances or money holdings in commercial banks. Instead, as you may know, or as you may actually do yourselves, you hold them in euro. So, when people have a family has, let's say, uh, 10,000 Bulgarian lever, which is the equivalent to 5,000 euro, and they keep these as precautionary money, or they, you know, if there is a doctor bill or something else, they'll use roughly 4,500 that they'll keep deposit in euro, and only 1,000 lever, the balance will be held in lever. That's, does it make sense? I mean, you keep the bulk of your money in euro simply because every single Bulgarian understands well that the lev is fundamentally weaker than the euro. So, if there is a problem, the likelihood of a problem with the euro is a lot smaller than the likelihood of a problem with the lev. All right. So, everybody keeps their lev in uh, euro, and then um, my thinking goes. There cannot be possibly a shortage for a simple reason that a commercial bank at any point in time can go to the central bank and exchange the euro for lever. Remember, according to a currency board, the legislation, the arrangement, the economic meaning of a currency board is that at any point in time, any or any commercial bank can exchange lever for euro with the central bank and exchange euro for lever within unlimited quantities. If the central bank doesn't have the lever, it will just print the lever. And so commercial bank can walk in with one billion euro and say, give me the corresponding according to the exchange rate, two billion lever, all right? So that's the arrangement. Well, the shortage was caused by people's desire or demand to borrow in lever. So, when, when it comes to depositing their money, people don't trust the Bulgarian currency, they deposit in euro. However, when it gets the time to borrowing, they say, well, it might be that the Bulgarian lev will collapse in value relative to euro, so instead of two lever for a euro, it's going to be five lever for a euro. We call this depreciate. So people's expectation that the Bulgarian currency will depreciate, they say, oh, I definitely want to borrow in lever. And when the depreciation occurs, I'll pay back with a lot cheaper uh, lever to the commercial bank and I'll effectively extract a profit. So people don't have confidence in the local money. Well, this doesn't yet create the shortage for money. The shortage for money, meaning for Bulgarian lever, is created because the commercial banks getting all the euro as deposits, they can just walk to the central bank, exchange one billion euro for two billion lever, and there can never be possibly a shortage because the exchange rate is fixed. What's the problem? Yes, commercial banks for the same reason are not willing to 
get or, or to, to give their euro and accept the long position in Neva. You see? So people don't want to uh, take uh, deposits in uh, Neva, but they want to borrow uh, in uh, Neva. Same thing with commercial banks, all right? So the result is what? Neither people, nor businesses, nor commercial banks have confidence in our local money, and the result is nobody wants to hold it, all right? And if nobody wants to hold it, what is... No, 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 <laughs> there, 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 is, there is a shortage. People demanded to borrow in it. You see, there is a demand. I want to go to the bank and say, hey, I will promise to pay you 1,000 with, I don't know, 1,200, two years from now. So people demand it because they will expect it depreciates. It relates to the next section of inflationary expectations. But the point is that if nobody wants to hold it, the only way to induce them to hold it is through higher reward for holding money. How do we call the reward for holding money? Interest. Interest rate. So, the only way that commercial banks can induce people to uh, hold more money is to offer higher interest rates on Bulgarian deposits, meaning deposits in Bulgarian level. All right? So, at this point, at this point, commercial banks pay on deposits denominated in Euro 3% and on deposits denominated in Lema 7%, for example, roughly, all right, to induce it to hold the money. Well, what about borrowing in Euro versus borrowing in Lema? Well, singular logic applies. People eagerly want to borrow in lever. Excuse me. They expect the lever to depreciate. They're eager to pay a higher interest rate. Commercial banks would be willing to discourage people to borrow in lever just because they don't have them or they don't have them in abundance. And at the same time, they want to induce them to borrow in euro. In this particular case, the interest rate charge on a loan in euro will be small, maybe 1 or 2 percent higher than deposit, 6 percent, and the interest rate on Bulgarian level will be, just for classroom purposes, uh, 9 percent, all right? So the result is that interest rates on both uh, euro deposits and euro loans are substantially lower than interest rates on level deposits in level down. And we call this currency premium. So currency premium is the interest rate that you must pay above and beyond some other stable currency. For us it is currency premium over euro. Why this whole story? Why spend 10 minutes on this whole story with currency, lever, euro, instability, possibly uh, risk premium and everything? Well, right in here. Confidence in money or confidence of money. Bulgarians as consumers and households do not have confidence in the money. So, they lower their demand to hold them in deposits. At the same time, they increase demand for loans. Similarly with businesses, similarly with commercial banks. So, when everybody has less confidence in the local currency and more confidence in the foreign currency, the result is a premium. Well, in the meantime, every one of us is trying to keep less Bulgarian level. So, when confidence, this is easier way, when confidence goes down, 
people would be willing to or eager to get rid of the local money. So their demand for money will fall. As people's confidence in a currency rises, their demand for money will increase. Simple as that. At this point, Bulgarians have higher confidence in the euro and they prefer to hold it in euro. Even though the interest that they get paid on holding euro is less due to the confidence. Confidence essentially would mean perceived stability. Do you have a question? Yeah. Does it mean that prices in Bulgaria rise in those uh, the countries that uh, the euro is the main currency called? No, it doesn't mean that yet because we are in a currency board and the exchange ratio is fixed and has been fixed at the same ratio for the last uh, 10 years. Now that's not the case and we shouldn't expect this now. But when the currency eventually uh, devalues, Bulgarian levy takes five lever to buy one euro instead, instead of currently two, at that point Bulgarian prices will jump dramatically. Uh, let's say if uh, the currency devalues three times, six for a euro, roughly for all imported prices that we pay, we will be paying the same euro, but in local currency, the prices will jump roughly or approximately three times. So what is building up right now is called inflationary potential, which at some point during the devaluation, prices will just jump much higher. Is this, is this answering your question? But for now, we're fixed. So when we import our, uh, let's say, uh, gasoline or gas or LPG, whatever our average is from uh, Russia, we still pay the same in dollars or in euro. I think now we're switching to euro arrangement. So again, if we're paying, we're just going to be paying the world prices. So we're going to be paying pretty much what the Germans are paying in Germany, at least for the import price. Well, then there are some costs, there are profit premium, I don't want to get into that anyway. All right, so uh, any uh, question on confidence before I get to the most complicated of all uh, factors? Any questions? All right, so let's move on, which is inflationary. expectations. Inflationary expectations simply means the expectation of a future price inflation. The expectation of a future price inflation effectively means the expectation of the future purchasing power of money. It is extremely simple. If we expect that our money is going to lose value a lot, we will demand less of it, right? So now I can buy with my money, let's say, uh, 10, uh, you know, 10 liters or 10 gallons of gasoline. If by the end of the year I'm going to be buying 8, I will demand less money. Maybe I'll just buy the gasoline today, all right? Or, for example, sugar. Sugar is commodity that we can store. If I can see that, oh, sugar's prices are going up, and so are coffee prices, and so are other agricultural food prices, so the purchasing power of money, at least in terms of food, food prices or agricultural commodities, people will effectively be eager to convert their money for the commodity. To convert today your money for commodity means what? To get rid of your money, and buy the commodity. Well, getting rid of your money means to lower your demand for money. So, the way to think about it is when people want to get rid of their money, they are lowering their demand for it. That's the way to think about it. So, as people have expectations about rising houses, uh, you guys are all familiar that housing prices are skyrocketing. 
uh, well, with mortgages doesn't matter. The, the important point is the house today is 50,000 and next year you expect it to be 60,000. What is the correct way to think about it? It is not the housing prices are rising, it is that the value of the currency is falling, all right? So, the way to think about it is if I have 10,000 today uh, in cash, I'd be, let's call it uh, naive or irrational to wait for the, for the price of the house to go from 50 to 60. I'd rather spend it today on a house even if I have to borrow some more, meaning to you know, purchase it with mortgage. And this is exactly what's been happening. A lot of people in the process of seeing skyrocketing high uh, housing prices, well, in Bulgaria we call this a real estate bubble, right? So everybody's seeing bubble prices. What people do? They rush to spend their money. In other words, hmm? Yes, and they accelerate at the same time the problem. Well, this is part of inflationary expectations. As long as they expect that housing prices will keep rising and rising, they'll go and rush and buy, and in the process of rushing to buy, drive the prices even higher. So, if it is a problem, or conceive it as a problem, then it accelerates or exacerbates the problem accelerates the rising prices. Again, we can't just always judge that it's a problem. What if it's wheat prices? Uh, wheat prices pretty much doubled over the last year. Is it a problem? Hmm? Uh, okay, tell me how it's a problem. Yes, we use it to make bread, so price of bread will double. What's the problem? The problem is that people's salaries don't double the same way. Ah, okay. The problem is that people's salaries don't double. So that's the way to think about it. So the way you gotta say it is not really a problem. It just means that we become scarcer. We price doubling, it shouldn't say, oh, it's bad or it's a problem. Sure, it is bad because it lowers the purchasing power of people's incomes. But you got to look at it from a different point of view. It signals to every farmer in the world that there is relative scarcity of wheat and that they'll be rewarded if they don't plant something else, I don't know, soybeans or corn or whatever, and instead switch to wheat. So, yes, it might be bad for, and here is the key, consumers that actually consume it, but it's actually good for producers and farmers, but the most important is simply that the rising price has a signal or provides a signal to both consumers and producers. What's the signal to consumers? Well, consume less because it's relatively scarce. I don't know, switch to rice, switch to potatoes, switch to corn, switch to soybeans, switch to whatever you are willing to switch to, all right? And to farmers, it says the signal, oh, it's relatively scarce, go ahead and plant more. So this is the correct way to think about prices. Well, with housing, what it says is, oh, there is phenomenal demand in houses if the housing prices accelerate, and it signals to construction businesses, go and build more, all right? I don't want to get into bubbles uh, now. I usually teach it in investments, you know, what's the genesis, etc., etc. So, when expectations, inflationary, uh, inflationary, expectations rise, it results in demand for money falling. This is simple common sense. Now, let's move on and uh, make a chart and discuss this chart. It is a fairly important chart in economics or in the theory of inflation. And this is what happens or what is the general process of inflation. The stages 
through which inflation goes. This here on the horizontal axis is time. And here we have delta as in growth rates. So we will have growth rates of two things. We'll have growth rates of money supply and growth rates of price increases. So we'll have increases in money and increases in prices. All right, so let's start with government printing roughly 10%, just for the sake of an example. So government prints at 10% and prices are fairly stable or were fairly stable. Because prices were fairly stable, people do not expect, at least initially, prices to rise. If they do not expect prices to rise, when the government prints 10% more money, and everybody has 10% more money, some of these new 10% people will actually hold in their wallet. You know, they'll be carrying 120 level rather than 100. Some will keep higher balances in their bank accounts, checking accounts or deposit accounts or demand accounts, and they will spend a little bit of that new money. So, suppose that they decide to hold 7% and decide to spend 3% of the newly fresh money. If they decide to spend only 3%, this means that of the new money, prices will rise by 3%. So, last year they were spending a certain amount, now they're spending 3% more, so prices will rise by 3%. Well, remember the difference between the prices and the money supply will be the revenue that the government or whoever issues the money first extracts. So, for them, the 7% difference is kind of like a pure profit. We called this last time, what's the cost? Inflation tax. Inflation tax. So, people hold, uh, spend three, hold the other seven, they are effectively extracting a 7% inflation tax. This is a profitable business, all right? So, next year, they'll print a little bit more, and people seeing prices rise by 3%, they see themselves wealthier, well, they'll now uh, spend 4 more percent, so they'll increase a little bit more their spending. Then the government, uh, again, prints a little bit more, they're extracting nicely, and prices begin to rise. So, at some point, for example, the government may be printing at 12% and prices may rise at 6%. So, the government is gaining, but gaining a little bit less, all right, because people aren't holding their money. So, what I can do now is effectively start drawing the curve of the growth of money supply and at the same time I will start drawing the curve of rising prices. So prices get to rise but here's the deal and that's the key. As the government accelerates the printing from 10 to 12 percent people will be spending larger and larger share of the new money, all right? So they'll be spending more and more and more. And at some point, and here is the key, and here is the key, the topic is money demand. People, rather than willing to hold some of the new money, they'll say, enough is enough. I better go and start spend some money. So, when the government prints the new money, people will actually take it all and spend it all. Why? Inflationary expectations. As government prints at 12, 13% and people are observing 8, 9, 10% inflation, 
And here is year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. So, and people have been observing that every single year prices went faster and higher. They will get sick and tired at some point and say, I'm not going to hold any more money and they're just going to be losing value. I'm going to buy cooking oil. Let's say people say, oh, cooking oil is going to last me, I don't know, five years or ten years without going bad, all right? So I'm going to buy coal, all right, for, for heating. I'm going to buy some wood. So suddenly people decide it's not worth but holding money anymore, it is actually better to take it and spend it, all right? And here is the next trick. If you have accumulated certain amount of money, let's say from 1,000 monthly, no, your balance, you've increased your balance maybe to 3,000 over a couple of years, suddenly you realize it's not worth holding 3,000, you got to, excuse me, spend some of that 3,000. Well, what is this effectively? This effectively means that you lower your money demand. When you lower your money demand, if the government is printing at, let's say, 15%, all the new 15% that the government prints and people take it, they will spend it right away, but here they have accumulated here they have accumulated some more balances, they'll get to spend some of them too. So government prints at 15%, people will spend at 17 or 18%, and prices will begin to rise faster than money supply. All right, is that step clear so far? So let's draw this and provide a number of, or just a few definitions. First of all, remember, at the first phase, so we call this first phase, you see where price, where prices rise slower than money supply, we call this Phase one, okay? Phase one is characterized by definition of rising money demand. So, demand for money, demand for money is rising or positive, okay? Demand for money is increasing. Well, demand for money is increasing, turns out to be mathematically equivalent, so we put in here mathematical equivalence sign, that delta money supply, so delta means change or increase, the rate of increase in money supply, and then on the other hand we have an increase in prices and money supply increases faster than prices. The way we can call this in economics, remember on the first or second lecture how do we call this delta money supply? We called it monetary inflation. Delta prices we called price inflation. So. Phase one it occurs when demand for money is positive, which is equivalent to saying that monetary inflation is higher than price inflation. And then we have this phase one has a name. We call this low inflation. Low inflation. You have to understand that low inflation doesn't mean 2 or 3 percent. It doesn't mean less than 5 percent. The meaning of low inflation is that prices don't rise 
as fast as money supply. All right. Bulgaria today we have official official price inflation of roughly uh, what 12.4 percent. Uh, unofficially it's probably roughly 24, 25 percent unofficially, and money supply grows at 30 percent. So, while money supply still grows faster than prices, the inflation is still low, even though there is actually a very high price inflation in absolute terms. 40% inflation is huge inflation, right? All right, so let's move on to here. Here we call this phase two. Phase two will be defined as demand for money goes down. So, in phase two, people lower their demand for money. This will immediately be equivalent to prices, change in prices or price inflation now becomes greater than monetary inflation. So, delta money supply now becomes less than prices. The better way to think about it is whether prices rise faster or slower than money supply. So, when prices rise, rise faster than money supply, then by definition you have what we just call high inflation. So, country goes and moves, this we call here, which is effectively the inflation tax, we sometimes have a name for it, it's called built-in inflation. Built-in inflation, it means that people actually have accumulated the cash, they have it, but they just haven't spent it yet today. And if and when they decide to spend it, prices just explode. So, low inflation is characterized by accumulation of built-in inflation. And suddenly, built-in inflation gets realized. In other words, people lower their demand for money, and then the result is phase two. Now, the next question is, what happens during phase two with government's revenues? Or, or the government's budget, and what happens with people's cash balances. People's cash balances, the answer is rapidly fall. For example, here, government is printing at 20%, so more or less everybody's got 20% more nominal money. Is that clear? But, here, the problem is, now that inflation is high, the prices rose 30%. So everybody has got 20% more money in nominal terms, but at the same time, prices are already 30% higher. So the purchasing power of everybody's money rapidly falls. You had a question? Yes, that's exactly the point. So, there is a perception, and here is the key, because prices rise faster than money supply, there is a perception of what people commonly call, of course incorrectly, but commonly call shortage of money. So, it simply means that everybody's got a lot less money than they actually need simply because the prices of sandwiches, coffee, bananas, or electric bill, whatever they're paying, simply prices go a lot higher. So, this, well, let's call it correctly, perceived shortage of money, perceived shortage of money,
results in social pressure for the government to do what? Yes, to supply the shortage, to cover the shortage. So, here there is a perceived shortage and the people says, give us more money. We don't have enough money because prices are rising too high. Businesses are clamoring for more money. Of course, commercial banks are clamoring for more money. And the result is what? Everyone in the society pressures the financial system, usually the central bank, to deliver, or the government, to deliver and provide more money. Well, what happens when the government delivers and provides more money? What's the result? Price inflation, but here's the key. Even faster rising prices. So here they were printing a 10%, we need 30. The government, what does? Does print a 30, but the minute they begin to satisfy that 30 by printing a 30, prices will rise effectively to 50%. So growth of prices. So the more the government succumbs to the demands for shortage of money, even faster the prices uh, go up, and even bigger becomes the perceived shortage. How they balance? How they balance? Okay, so how they balance this? Well, uh, many governments simply don't balance it. They don't bother to balance it. And let's explain why. If they decide suddenly to stop the printing press, Immediately inflation will fall, so they stop the printing press, suddenly this curve goes down, price inflation goes down, the economy will and must always necessarily suffer, suffer what's called a post-inflation recession or post-inflation depression. So to keep the economy going, the government's got to print even more. If the government stops printing or starts printing a whole lot less, suddenly a lot of people aren't going to be getting their money. Suddenly prices are high, people are getting a lot less or no new money. And this will result in a collapse in consumption, including government's consumption. Well, when everybody is consuming less, and also there will be, by the way, a collapse in investments, the result will be a collapse in GDP. We simply call this a recession, and if it's very severe form, we call it a depression. So, the government does not want to stop the printing press, and is willing or eager to accelerate the printing press in order not to suffer the political consequences of a post-inflation collapse. Well, then the question becomes, can they simply do it forever? No. Well, they can't, they will have to denominate the prices. Like always get this three zero. Yeah, so, so, so the point is, the minute they try, people will, as a result, lower their demand for money. So suddenly you get an accelerating supply of money, and suddenly demand for money goes close to zero, and the result will be, Value of money equals to zero. When the supply grows rapidly and demand for money goes close to zero, value of money goes to zero. How do we call this situation where the value of money goes practically to zero? Yes, we have a name, hyperinflation. During hyperinflation, money loses its value. Its value becomes no, zero, sorry, guys. zero. And people just don't keep the money, they just prefer to burn it or do something else, all right? So, this is called hyperinflation. So, the answer back to your question is, if it happens that the government insists on maintaining the inflationary boom, the result will be a complete collapse of the monetary unit, meaning the value of the paper will become zero. And if the value of the paper becomes zero, will mean certainly a complete collapse of the whole financial system. All the value of the banks will become zero because everything's denominated into local currency. So 
everything that's related to the whole local currency evaporates. So you had a question. Let's see what it was. All right. So uh, let's try any other questions. I think we're right finished. Uh, I'm actually finished with this uh, topic. Let's see any final questions. All right. Then we continue next time with the next chapter. Did you have a question? Or we'll continue next time with it. Yes, yes, right now the last number that I received uh, is 45. This is a, official. The no, it be well, 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 well. Uh, okay, let's discuss this next time. Not necessarily because he's printing at 45%. Inflation in Russia is still low because prices rise roughly at what, 20, 25%? Well, if prices rise at 25% and government prints at 40, everybody's happy, all right? All right, let's finish for today.